Forward to the Night Operator by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Forward. Summed up in short, the Hill Division is a vicious piece of track. Also, it is a classic in its profound contempt for the stereotyped equations and formulae of engineering. And it is that way for the very simple reason that it could not be any other way. The mountains objected, and objected strenuously, to the process of manhandling. They were there first, the mountains, that was all, and their surrender was a bitter matter. So, from Big Cloud, the divisional point, at the eastern fringe of the Rockies, to where the foothills of the Sierras on the western side merge with the more open rolling country, the right-of-way performs gyrations that would not shame an acrobatic star. It sweeps through the rifts in the range like a freed bird from the open door of its cage, clings to canyon edges where a hissing stream bubbles and boils eighteen hundred feet below, burrows its way into the heart of things in long tunnels and short ones, circles a projecting spur in a dizzy whirl, and swoops from the higher to the lower levels in grades whose percentages the passenger department does not deem it policy to specify in its advertising literature but before which the men in the cabs and the cabooses shut their teeth and try hard to remember the prayers they learned at their mother's knees some parts of it are worse than others naturally but no part of it to the last inch of its single tracked mileage is pretty leaving out the scenery which is grand that is the hill division and the men who man the shops who pull the throttles on the big ten-wheel mountain racers who swing the pick and shovels in the lurching cabs, who do the work about the yards or from the cupola of a caboose stare out at a string of wriggling flats, boxes, and gondolas, and at night-time watch the high-flung sparks sail heavenward as the full deep-chested notes of the exhaust roar and accompaniment in their ears, are men with calloused, horny hands, toilers, grimy of face and dress, rough if you like, not gentle of word, nor sometimes of action, but men whose hearts are big and right, who look you in the face, and the grip of whose paws, as they are extended after a hasty cleansing on a hunk of more or less greasy waste, is the grip of men. Many of these have lived their lives, done their work, passed on, and left no record, barely a memory behind them as other men in other places and in other spheres of work have done and always will do, but others for this or that, by circumstance or personality or opportunity, have woven around themselves the very legends and traditions of their environment. And so these are the stories of the Hill Division and of the men who wrought upon it, the stories of those days when it was young and in the making, the stories of the days when Carleton, Royal Carleton, was superintendent, when gruff, big-hearted, big paunch Tommy Regan was master mechanic, when the grizzled, gray-streaked Harvey was division engineer, and little Dr. McTurk was the company surgeon, and Riley was the train master, and Spence was the chief dispatcher, the stories of men who have done brave duty and come to honor and glory and their reward and the stories of some who have gone into division for the last time on orders from the great trainmaster, and who will never railroad any more. F.L.P. End of Forward Chapter 1, Part 1 of The Night Operator by Frank L. Packard This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. THE NIGHT OPERATOR PART ONE Toddles, in the beginning, wasn't exactly a railroad man, for several reasons. First, he wasn't a man at all. Secondly, he wasn't, strictly speaking, on the company's payroll. Third, which is apparently irrelevant, everybody said that he was a bad one. And fourth, because Hawkeye nicknamed him Toddles. Toddles had another name, Christopher Heislop Hoogan. But Big Cloud never lay awake at nights, losing any sleep over that. On the first run that Christopher Heislop Hoogan ever made, Hawkeye looked him over for a moment, said, Toddles, short-like, 
and short-like that settled the matter so far as the Hill Division was concerned. His name was Toddles. Piecemeal, Toddles wouldn't convey anything to you to speak of. You'd have to see Toddles coming down the aisle of a car to get him at all. And then the chances are you'd turn around after he'd gone by and stare at him, and it would be even money that you'd call him back and fish for a dime to buy something by way of excuse. Toddles got a good deal of business that way. Toddles had a uniform and a regular run all right, but he wasn't what he passionately longed to be, a legitimate dyed-in-the-wool railroader. His paycheck, plus commissions, came from the news company down east that had the railroad concession. Toddles was a newsboy. In his blue uniform and silver buttons, Toddles used to stack up about the height of the back of the car seats as he hawked his wares along the aisles, and the only thing that was big about him was his head, which looked as though it had got a whopping big lead on his body and didn't intend to let the body cut the lead down any. This meant a big cap, and as Toddles used to tilt the visor forward, the tip of his nose, bar his mouth, which was generous, was about all one got of his face. Cap, buttons, magazines, and peanuts, that was Toddles. All except his voice. Toddles had a voice that would make you jump if you were nervous the minute he opened the car door, and if you weren't nervous, you would be before he had reached the other end of the aisle. It began low down, somewhere on high G, and went through you shrill as the east wind, and ended like the shriek of a brake shoe with everything the Westinghouse equipment had to offer cutting loose on a quick stop. Hawkeye? That was what Toddles called his beady-eyed conductor in retaliation. Hawkeye used to nag Toddles every chance he got, and being Toddles' conductor, Hawkeye had a good many chances. In a word, Hawkeye, carrying the punch on the local passenger that happened to be the run Toddles was given when the news company sent him out from the east, used to think he got a good deal of fun out of Toddles. Only his idea of fun and Toddles' idea of fun were as divergent as the poles, that was all. Toddles, however, wasn't anybody's fool, not by several degrees, not even Hawkeye's. Toddles hated Hawkeye like poison and his hate, apart from daily annoyances, was deep-seated. It was Hawkeye who had dubbed him Toddles, and Toddles repudiated the name with his heart, his soul, and his fists. Toddles wasn't anybody's fool, whatever the division thought, and he was right down to the basic root of things from the start. Coupled with the stunted growth that nature, in a miserly mood, had doled out to him, None knew better than himself that the name of Toddles, keeping that nature stuff patently before everybody's eyes, damned him in his aspirations for a bona fide railroad career. Other boys got a job and got their feet on the ladder as call boys or in the roundhouse. Toddles got a grin. Toddles pestered everybody for a job. He pestered Carlton, the super. He pestered Tommy Regan, the master mechanic. Every time that he saw anybody in authority, Toddles spoke up for a job. He was in deadly earnest, and got a grin. Toddles, with a basket of unripe fruit and stale chocolates and his bestseller voice, was one thing. But Toddles, as anything else, was just Toddles. Toddles repudiated the name, and he did it forcefully. Not that he couldn't take his share of a bit of guying, but because he felt that he was face to face with a vital factor in the career he longed for, so he fought. And if nature had been niggardly in one respect, she had been generous in others. Toddles, for all his size, possessed the heart of a lion and the strength of a young ox, and he used both with black and bloody effect on the eyes and noses of the call boys and younger element who called him Toddles. He fought it all along the line, at the drop of a hat, at a whisper of Toddles. There wasn't a day went by that Toddles wasn't in a row, and the women, the mothers of the defeated warriors, whose eyes were puffed and whose noses trickled crimson, denounced him in virulent language over their wash-tubs and the back fences of Big Cloud. You see, they didn't understand him, so they called him a bad one, and being from the East and not one of themselves, a New York gutter snipe. But for all that, the name stuck. Up and down through the Rockies it was, Toddles. 
Toddles, with the idea of getting a layover on a siding, even went to the extent of signing himself in full, Christopher Hyslop Hoogan. Every time his signature was in order, but the official documents in which he was concerned, being of a private nature between himself and the news company, did not in the very nature of things have much effect on the Hill Division. Certainly the big fellows never knew he had any name but Toddles, and cared less. But they knew him as Toddles, all right. All of them, every last one of them. Toddles was everlastingly and eternally bothering them for a job. Any kind of a job, no matter what, just so it was real railroading, and so a fellow could line up with everybody else when the pay car came along and look forward to being something some day. Toddles, with time, of course, grew older, up to about seventeen or so, but he didn't grow any bigger, not enough to make it noticeable. Even Toddles' voice wouldn't break. It was his young heart that did all the breaking there was done. Not that he ever showed it. No one ever saw a tear in the boy's eyes. It was clenched fists for Toddles, clenched fists and passionate attack. And therein, while Toddles had grasped the basic truth that his nickname militated against his ambitions, he erred in another direction that was equally fundamental, if not more so. And here it was Bob Donkin, the night dispatcher, as white a man as his record after years of train handling was white, a railroad man from the ground up if there ever was one, and one of the best, who set Toddles, but we'll come to that presently. We've got our clearance now, and we're off with rights through. Number 83, Hawkeye's train and Toddles, scheduled Big Cloud on the eastbound run at 9.05, and on the night the story opens, they were about a half hour away from the little mountain town that was the divisional point, as Toddles, his basket of edibles in the crook of his arm, halted in the forward end of the second-class smoker to examine again the fistful of change that he had dug out of his pants pocket with his free hand. Toddles was in unusually bad humor, and he scowled. With exceeding deftness he separated one of the coins from the others, using his fingers like the teeth of a rake, and dropped the rest back jingling into his pocket. The coin that remained he put into his mouth and bit on it, hard. His scowl deepened. Somebody had presented Toddles with a lead quarter. It wasn't so much the quarter, though Toddles' salary wasn't so big as some people's who would have felt worse over it. It was his amour propre that was touched, deeply. It wasn't often that anyone could put so bald a thing as lead money across on Toddles. Toddles' mind harked back along the aisles of the cars behind him. He had only made two sales that round, and he had changed a quarter each time. For the pretty girl with the big picture hat who had giggled at him when she bought a package of chewing gum, and the man with the three-carat diamond tie pin in the parlor car, a little more than on the edge of inebriety, who had got on at the last stop and who had bought a cigar from him. Toddles thought it over for a bit, decided he wouldn't have a fuss with a girl anyway, balked at a parlor car fracas with a drunk, dropped the coin back into his pocket and went on into the combination baggage and express car. Here, just inside the door, was Toddles, or rather the news company's, chest. Toddles lifted the lid, and then his eyes shifted slowly and traveled up the car. Things were certainly going badly with Toddles that night. There were four men in the car, Bob Donkin, coming back from a holiday trip somewhere up the line, MacNichol, the baggage master, Nolte, the express messenger, and Hawkeye. Toddle's inventory of the contents of the chest had been hurried, but intimate. A small bunch of six bananas was gone, and Hawkeye was munching them unconcernedly. It wasn't the first time the big hulking six-foot conductor had pilfered the boy's chest, not by many, and never paid for the pilfering. That was Hawkeye's idea of a joke. Hawkeye was talking to Nulty, elaborately simulating ignorance of Toddles' presence, and he was talking about Toddles. <clears throat> sure, said Hawkeye, his mouth full of banana. He'll be a great railroad man some day. He's the stuff they're made of. <laughs> You can see it sticking out all over him. He's only selling peanuts now till he grows up and... 
Toddles put down his basket and planted himself before the conductor. "'You pay for those bananas,' said Toddles in a low voice, which was high. "'When he'll grow up,' continued Hawkeye, peeling more fruit. "'I don't know. You got me. The first time I saw him two years ago, I imagined him he wasn't bigger than he is now. I guess he grows backward. Have a banana?' He offered one to Nulty, who refused it. "'You pay for those bananas, you big stiff!' squealed Toddles belligerently. Hawkeye turned his head slowly and turned his little beady black eyes on Toddles. Then he turned with a wink to the others and for the first time in two years offered payment. He fished into his pocket and handed Toddles a twenty-dollar bill. There always was a mean streak in Hawkeye, more or less of a bully, none too well liked and whose name on the payroll, by the way, was Reynolds. "'Take fifteen cents out of that,' he said, with no idea that the boy could change the bill. For a moment Toddles glared at the yellow back, and then a thrill of unholy glee came to Toddles. He could just about make it. Business all around had been pretty good that day, particularly on the run west in the morning. Hawkeye went on with the exposition of his idea of humor, at Toddles' expense, and Toddles went back to his chest and his reserve funds. Toddles counted out eighteen dollars in bills, made a neat pile of four quarters, the lead one on the bottom, another neat pile of the odd change, and returned to Hawkeye. The lead quarter wouldn't go far toward liquidating Hawkeye's long-standing indebtedness, but it would help some. Hawkeye counted the bills carefully and crammed them into his pocket. Toddles dropped the neat little pile of quarters into Hawkeye's hand, they counted themselves, and Hawkeye put those in his pocket. Toddles counted out the odd change piece by piece, and as Hawkeye put that in his pocket, Toddles put his fingers to his nose. Queer, isn't it, the way things happen? Think of a man's whole life, aspirations, hopes, ambitions, everything, pivoting on a lead quarter. But then they say that opportunity knocks once at the door of every man, and if that be true, let it be remarked in passing that Toddles wasn't deaf. Hawkeye, making Toddles a target for a parting jibe, took up his lantern and started through the train to pick up the fares from the last stop. In due course he halted before the inebriated one with the glittering tie-pin in the smoking compartment of the parlor car. "'Take it, please,' said Hawkeye. "'So busy to buy his ticket,' the man informed him with heavy confidence. "'What's a uh, fair loon dam big cloud?' "'One fifty,' said Hawkeye curtly. The man produced a roll of bills and from the roll extracted a two-dollar note. Hawkeye handed him back two quarters and started to punch a cash fare slip. He looked up to find the man holding out one of the quarters insistently, if somewhat unsteadily. "'What's the matter?' demanded Hawkeye brusquely. "'Man?' said the man. A drummer grinned, and an elderly gentleman from his magazine looked up inquiringly over his spectacles. "'Bad?' Hawkeye brought his elbow sharply around to focus his lamp on the coin. Then he leaned over and rang it on the window sill. only it wouldn't ring. It was indubitably bad. Hawkeye, however, was dealing with a drunk, and Hawkeye always did have a mean streak in him. "'It's perfectly good,' he asserted gruffly. The man rolled an eye at the conductor that mingled a sudden shrewdness and anger, and appealed to his fellow travellers. The verdict was against Hawkeye, and Hawkeye ungraciously pocketed the lead piece and handed over another quarter. "'Say,' observed the inebriated one instantly, "'say, conductor, I don't like you. You thought I was... So drunk, I, I wouldn't know, huh? That's where you fool yourself. What do you mean? Hawkeye bridled virtuously for the benefit of the drummer and the old gentleman with the spectacles. And then the other began to laugh immoderately. <laughs> Same old quarter, said he. Same old quarter back again. Great system. Peanut boy, conductor. Pass it off on one, uh, other passes it off on someone else, just passed it off on 
<laughs> Peanut Boy, for a joke, gonna give him a dollar when he comes back. Oh, you did, did you? snapped Hawkeye ominously. And you mean to insinuate that I deliberately tried to... Sure, declared the man heartily. You're a liar, announced Hawkeye, sputtering mad. And what's more, since it came from you, you'll take it back. He dug into his pocket for the ubiquitous lead piece. Not on your life, said the man earnestly. You hang on to it, old top. I didn't pass it off on you. Ha <laughs> ha, exploded the drummer suddenly. <laughs> and the elderly gentleman smiled. Hawkeye's face went red and then purple. Go away, said the man petulantly. I don't, I don't like you. Go away. Go, go, go and tell Peanuts I, I, I got a dollar for him. And Hawkeye went, but Toddles never got the dollar. Hawkeye went out of the smoking compartment of the parlor car with a lead quarter in his pocket because he couldn't do anything else, which didn't soothe his feelings any, and he went out mad enough to bite himself. The drummer's guffaw followed him, and he thought he even caught a chuckle from the elderly party with the magazine and spectacles. Hawkeye was mad, and he was quite well aware, painfully well aware, that he had looked like a fool, which is about one of the meanest feelings there is to feel, and as he made his way forward through the train, he grew madder still. That change was the change from his twenty-dollar bill. He had not needed to be told that the lead quarter had come from Toddles. The only question to all in doubt was whether or not Toddles had put the counterfeit coin over on him knowingly and with malice aforethought. Hawkeye, however, had an intuition deep down inside him that there wasn't any doubt even about that, and as he opened the door of the baggage car, his intuition was vindicated. There was a grin on the faces of Nulty, McNichol, and Bob Donkin that disappeared with suspicious celerity at sight of him as he came through the door. There was no hesitation then on Hawkeye's part. Toddles, equipped for another excursion through the train with a stack of magazines and books that almost hit him, received a sudden and vicious clout on the side of the ear. "'You try your tricks on me, would you?' Hawkeye snarled. "'Lead quarters, huh?' Another clout. "'I'll teach you, you blasted little runt!' And with the clouts, the stack of carefully balanced periodicals went flying over the floor, and with the clouts, the nagging and the hectoring and the bullying that had rankled for close on two years in Toddle's turbulent soul, rose in a sudden, all-possessing sweep of fury. Toddles was a fighter, with the heart of a fighter, and Toddles' cause was just. He couldn't reach the conductor's face, so he went for Hawkeye's legs, and the screams of rage from his high-pitched voice as he shot himself forward sounded like a cage full of Australian cockatoos on the rampage. Toddles was small, pitifully small for his age, but he wasn't an infant in arms, not for a minute and in action Toddles was as near to a wild cat as anything else that comes handy by way of illustration. Two legs and one arm he twined and twisted around Hawkeye's legs, and the other arm, with a hard and knotty fist on the end of it, caught the conductor a wicked jab in the region of the bottom button of his vest. The brass button peeled the skin off Toddles' knuckles, but the jab doubled the conductor forward, and coincident with Hawkeye's winded grunt, the lantern in his hand sailed ceilingwards, crashed into the center lamps in the roof of the car, and down in a shower of tinkling glass, dripping oil and burning wicks, came the wreckage to the floor. There was a yell from Nulty, but Toddles hung on like grim death. Hawkeye was bawling fluent profanity and seeing red. Toddles heard one and sensed the other, and he clung grimly on. He was all doubled up around Hawkeye's knees, and in that position Hawkeye couldn't get at him very well, and besides, Toddles had his own plan of battle. He was waiting for an extra heavy lurch of the car. It came. Toddles' muscles strained legs and arms and back in concert, and for an instant across the car they tottered, Hawkeye staggering in a desperate attempt to maintain his equilibrium, and then down speaking generally on a heterogeneous pile of express parcels concretely with an eloquent squunch on a crate of eggs thirty dozen of them at forty cents a dozen toddles over his rage experienced a sickening sense of disaster but still he clung he didn't dare let go 
Hawkeye's fists, both in an effort to recover himself and in an endeavor to reach Toddles, were going like a windmill, and Hawkeye's threats were something terrible to listen to. And now they rolled over, and Toddles was underneath, and then they rolled over again, and then a hand locked on Toddles' collar, and he was yanked, terrier fashion, to his feet. His face white and determined, his fists doubled, Toddles waited for Hawkeye to get up. The word run wasn't in Toddles' vocabulary. He hadn't long to wait. Hawkeye lunged up, draped in the broken crate. A sight! The road always prided itself on the natty uniforms of its train crews, but Hawkeye wasn't dressed in uniform then, mostly egg yolks. He made a dash for Toddles, but he never reached the boy. Bob Donkin was between them. "'Cut it out,' said Donkin coldly, as he pushed Toddles behind him. "'You asked for it, Reynolds, and you got it. Now cut it out.' And Hawkeye cut it out. It was pretty generally understood that Bob Donkin never talked too much for show. And Bob Donkin was bigger than Toddles, a whole lot bigger, as big as Hawkeye himself. Hawkeye cut it out. Funny, the egg part of it? Well, perhaps. But the fire wasn't. True, they got it out with the help of the hand extinguishers before it did any serious damage, for Nolte had gone at it on the jump. But while it lasted, the burning oil on the car floor looked dangerous. Anyway, it was bad enough so they couldn't hide it when they got into Big Cloud, and Hawkeye and Toddles went on the carpet for it the next morning in the super's office. Carlton, Royal Carlton, reached for a match and, to keep his lips straight, clamped them firmly on the amber mouthpiece of his briar, and stumpy, big paunch Tommy Regan, the master mechanic who was sitting in a chair by the window, reached hurriedly into his back pocket for his chewing, and looked out of the window to hide a grin, as the two came in and ranged themselves in front of the super's desk. Hawkeye, six feet and a hundred and ninety pounds, and Toddles trailing him, mostly cap and buttons, and no weight at all. Carlton didn't ask many questions. He'd asked them before, of Bob Donkin. And the dispatcher hadn't gone out of his way to invest the conductor with any glorified halo. Carlton, always a strict disciplinarian, said what he had to say and said it quietly. But he meant to let the conductor have the worst of it, and he did, in a way that was all Carlton's own. Two years picking on a youngster didn't appeal to Carlton, no matter who the youngster was. Before he was half through, he had the big conductor squirming. Hawkeye was looking for something else, besides a galling and matter-of-fact impartiality that accepted himself and Toddles as being on exactly the same plane and level. "'There's a case of eggs,' said Carlton at the end. "'You can divide up the damage between you. And I'm going to change your runs, unless you've got some good reason to give me why I shouldn't.' He waited for an answer. Hawkeye, towering, sullen, his eyes resting bitterly on Regan, having caught the master mechanic's grin, said nothing. Toddles, whose head barely showed above the top of Carlton's desk, and the whole of him sizing up about big enough to go into the conductor's pocket, was equally silent. Toddles was thinking of something else. "'Very good,' said Carlton, suavely, as he surveyed the ridiculous incongruity before him. I'll change your runs, then. I can't have you two men brawling and prize-fighting every trip. There was a sudden sound from the window, as though Regan had got some of his blackstrap juice down the wrong way. Hawkeye's face went black as thunder. Carlton's face was like a sphinx. That'll do, then, he said. You can go, both of you. Hawkeye stamped out of the room and down the stairs. But Toddles stayed. "'Please, Mr. Carlton, won't you give me a job on—' Toddles stopped. So had Regan's chuckle. Toddles the irrepressible was at it again, and Toddles after a job, any kind of a job, was something that Regan's experience had taught him to fly from without standing on the order of his flight. Regan hurried from the room. Toddles watched him go, kind of speculatively, kind of reproachfully, and then he turned to Carlton. "'Please give me a job, Mr. Carlton,' he pleaded. "'Give me a job, won't you?' It was only yesterday on the platform that Toddles had waylaid the super with the same demand, and about every day before that as far back as Carlton could remember. 
it was hopelessly chronic. Anything convincing or appealing about it had gone long ago. Toddle said it parrot fashion now. Carleton took refuge in severity. See here, young man, he said grimly. You were brought into this office for a reprimand and not to apply for a job. You can thank your stars and Bob Donkin you haven't lost the one you've got. Now get out. I'd make good if you gave me one, said Toddles earnestly. Honest, I would, Mr. Carleton. Get out, said the super, not altogether unkindly. I'm busy. Toddles swallowed a lump in his throat, but not until after his head was turned and he'd started for the door so the super couldn't see it. Toddles swallowed the lump and got out. He hadn't expected anything else, of course. The refusals were just as chronic as the demands. But that didn't make each new one any easier for Toddles. It made it worse. Toddles' heart was heavy as he stepped out into the hall, and the iron was in his soul. He was seventeen now, and it looked as though he never would get a chance, except to be a newsboy all his life. Toddles swallowed another lump. He loved railroading. It was his one ambition, his one desire. If he could ever get a chance, he'd show them. He'd show them he wasn't a joke just because he was small. Toddles turned at the head of the stairs to go down when somebody called his name. Here, Toddles, come here. Toddles looked over his shoulder, hesitated, then marched in through the open door of the dispatcher's room. Bob Donkin was alone there. What's your name, Toddles? inquired Donkin, as Toddles halted before the dispatcher's table. Toddles froze instantly, hard. His fist doubled. There was a smile on Donkin's face. Then his fist slowly uncurled. The smile on Donkin's face had broadened, but there wasn't any malice in the smile. "'Christopher Highslop Hogan said Toddles, unbending. Donkin put his hand quickly to his mouth and coughed. Mm-hmm, <clears throat> said he pleasantly. "'Super hard on you this morning, Hogan." And with the words, Toddles' heart went out to the big dispatcher, Hoogan, and a man-to-man -to -man tone. No, said Toddles cordially. Say, I thought you were on the night trick. Double shift, short-handed, replied Donkin. Come from New York, don't you? Yes, said Toddles. Mother and father still down there? It came quick and unexpected, and Toddles stared for a moment. Then he walked over to the window. I uh, haven't got any he said. There wasn't any sound for an instant, save the clicking of the instruments. Then Duncan spoke again, a little gruffly. When are you going to quit making an ass of yourself? Toddle swung from the window, hurt. Duncan, after all, was like all the rest of them. Well, prompted the dispatcher. You go to blazes, said Toddles bitterly, and started for the door. Duncan halted him. You're only fooling yourself, Hoogan, he said coolly. If you wanted what you'd call a real railroad job as much as you pretend you do, you'd get one. Huh? demanded Toddles defiantly and went back to the table. A fella, said Duncan, putting a little sting into his words, never got anywhere by going around with a chip on his shoulder, fighting everybody because they called him Toddles and making a nuisance of himself with the big fellas until they got sick of the sight of him. It was a pretty stiff arraignment. Toddles choked over it, and the angry blood flushed to his cheeks. "'That's all right for you,' he sputtered out hotly. "'You don't look too small for the train crews at the roundhouse, and they don't call you Toddles, so nobody will forget it. What did you do?' "'I'll tell you what I'd do,' said Donkin quietly. "'I'd make everybody on the division wish their own name was Toddles before I was through with them, and I'd make a job for myself.' Toddles blinked helplessly. "'Getting right down to a cash fare,' continued Donkin, after a moment, as Toddles did not speak. "'They're not so far wrong, either, about you sizing up pretty small for the train crews or the roundhouse, are they?' "'No,' admitted Toddles reluctantly. "'But—' "'Then why not uh, something where there's no handicap hanging over you?' suggested the dispatcher, and his hand reached out and touched the sender. "'The key, for instance.' "'But I don't know anything about it,' said Toddles, still helplessly. Well, "'That's just it,' returned Donkin smoothly. "'You never tried to learn.' 
Toddle's eyes widened, and into Toddle's heart leaped a sudden joy. A new world seemed to open out before him in which aspirations, ambitions, longings, all were a reality. A key! That was real railroading. The top notch of railroading, too. First an operator, and then a dispatcher, and, and, and then his face fell, and the vision faded. How'd I get a chance to learn? he said miserably. Who'd teach me? The smile was back on Donkin's face as he pushed his chair from the table, stood up, and held out his hand, man-to-man -man fashion. "'I will,' he said. "'I liked your grit last night, Hoogan. And if you want to be a railroad man, I'll make you one, before I'm through. I've some old instruments you can have to practice on, and I've nothing to do with my spare time. What do you say?' Toddles didn't say anything. For the first time since Toddles' advent to the Hill Division, there were tears in Toddles' eyes for someone else to see. Donkin laughed. All right, old man, you're on. See that you don't throw me down. And keep your mouth shut. You'll need all your wind. It's work that counts and nothing else. Now chase yourself. I'll dig up the things you'll need, and you can drop in here and get them when you come off your run tonight. Spare time. Bob Donkin didn't have any spare time those days. But that was Donkin's way. Spence, sick, and two men handling the dispatching where three had handled it before, didn't leave Bob Donkin much spare time. Not much. But a boost for the kid was worth a sacrifice. Donkin went at it as earnestly as Toddles did. And Toddles was in deadly earnest. End of chapter one, part one. Chapter one, part two of The Night Operator by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Night Operator, chapter one, part two. When Toddles left the dispatcher's office that morning with Donkin's promise to teach him the key, Toddles had a hazy idea that Donkin had wings concealed somewhere under his coat and was an angel in disguise, and at the end of two weeks he was sure of it, but at the end of a month Bob Donkin was a god. Throw Bob Donkin down, Toddles would have sold his soul for the dispatcher. It wasn't easy, though, and Bob Donkin wasn't an easy-going taskmaster, not by long odds. Donkin had a tongue, and on occasions could use it. Short and quick in his explanations, he expected his pupil to get it short and quick, either that or Donkin's opinion of him. But Toddles stuck. He'd have crawled on his knees for Donkin anywhere, and he worked like a major, not only for his own advancement, but for what he came to prize quite as much, if not more, Donkin's approval. Toddles, mindful of Donkin's words, didn't fight so much as the days went by, though he found it difficult to swear off all at once, and on his runs he studied his Morse code, and he had the calls of every station on the division off by heart right from the start. Toddles mastered the sending by leaps and bounds. But the taking came slower, as it does for everybody. But even at that, at the end of six weeks, if it wasn't thrown at him too fast and hard, Toddles could get it, after a fashion. Take it all around, Toddles felt like whistling most of the time, and, pleased with his own progress, looked forward to starting in presently as a full-fledged operator. He mentioned the matter to Bob Donkin once. Donkin picked his words and spoke fervently. Toddles never brought the subject up again. And so things went on. Late summer turned to early fall, and early fall to still sharper weather, until there came the night that the operator at Blind River muddled his orders and gave number 73 the westbound fast freight her clearance against the second section of the eastbound limited that doomed them to meet somewhere head on in the glacier canyon the night that toddles but there's just a word or two that comes before that when it was all over it was up to sam beale the blind river operator straight enough beale blundered that's all there was to it that covers it all he blundered it would have finished Beale's railroad career forever and a day, 
Only Beale played the man, and the instant he realized what he had done, even while the tail lights of the freight were disappearing down the track and he couldn't stop her, he was stammering the tale of his mistake over the wire, the sweat beads dripping from his wrist, his face gray with horror, to Bob Donkin under the green-shaded lamp in the dispatcher's room at Big Cloud, miles away. Donkin got the miserable story over the chattering wire, got it before it was half told, cut Beale out and began to pound the gap call. And as though it were before him in reality, that stretch of track, fifteen miles of it, from Blind River to the Gap, unfolded itself like a grisly panorama before his mind. There wasn't a half-mile of tangent at a single stretch in the whole of it. It swung like the writhings of a snake, through cuts and tunnels, hugging the canyon walls, twisting this way and that. Anywhere else there might be a chance, one in a thousand even, that they would see each other's headlights in time. Here it was disaster quick and absolute. Duncan's lips were set in a thin, straight line. The gap answered him, and the answer was like the knell of doom. He had not expected anything else. He had only hoped against hope. The second section of the Limited had pulled out of the gap, eastbound, two minutes before. The two trains were in the open against each other's orders. In the next room, Carleton and Regan, over their pipes, were at their nightly game of Pedro. Donkin called them, and his voice sounded strange to himself. Chairs scraped and crashed to the floor, and an instant later the super and the master mechanic were in the room. "'What's wrong, Bob?' Carleton flung the words from him in a single breath. Donkin told him but his fingers were on the key again as he talked. There was still one chance, worse than the thousand-to-one shot, but it was the only one. Between the Gap and Blind River, eight miles from the Gap, seven miles from Blind River, was Cassill's Siding. But there was no night man at Cassill's, and the little town lay a mile from the station. It was ten o'clock. Donkin's watch lay face up on the table before him. The day man at Cassill's went off at seven. The chance was that the day man might have come back to the station for something or other. Not much of a chance? No, not much. It was a possibility, that was all. And Donkin's fingers worked. The seventeen, the life and death calling. Calling on the night trick to the day man at Cassiel's sighting. Carleton came and stood at Donkin's elbow, and Regan stood at the other, and there was silence now, save only for the key that under Donkin's fingers seemed to echo its stammering appeal about the room like the sobbing of a human soul. C.S., 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 Donkin called, and then the seventeen, and then hold second number two, and then the same thing over and over again, and there was no answer. It had turned cold that night, and there was a fire in the little heater. Donkin had opened the draft a little while before, and the sheet-iron sides now began to purr red-hot. Nobody noticed it. Regan's kindly, good-humored face had the stamp of horror in it, and he pulled at his scraggly brown mustache, his eyes seemingly fascinated by Donkin's fingers. Everybody's eyes, the three of them, were on Donkin's fingers and the key. Carleton was like a man of stone, motionless, his face set harder than face was ever carved in marble. It grew hot in the room, but Donkin's fingers were like ice on the key, and strong man though he was, he faltered. "'Oh, my God!' he whispered, and never a prayer rose more fervently from lips than those three broken words. Again he called, and again, and again, the minutes slipped away, Still he called with the life and death, the seventeen, called and called, and there was no answer save that echo in the room that brought the perspiration streaming now from Regan's face, a harder light into Carlton's eyes, and a chill like death into Donkin's heart. Suddenly Donkin pushed back his chair, and his fingers from the key touched the crystal of his watch. The second section will have passed castles now, he said in a curious, unnatural, matter-of-fact tone. It'll bring them together about a mile east of there. In another minute. And then Carleton spoke, master railroader, royal Carton. It was up to him. All the pity of it, the ruin, the disaster, the lives out, all the bitterness to cope with as he could. And it was in his eyes, all of it. But his voice was quiet. 
It rang quick, peremptory, his voice, but quiet. Clear the line, Bob, he said. Plug in the roundhouse for the wrecker, and tell them to send up town for the crew. Toddles? What did Toddles have to do with this? Well, a good deal, in one way and another. We're coming to Toddles now. You see, Toddles, since his fracas with Hawkeye, had been put on the Elk River local run that left Big Cloud at 9.45 in the morning for the run west, and scheduled Big Cloud again on the return trip at 10.10 in the evening. It had turned cold that night, after a day of rain. Pretty cold. The thermometer can drop on occasions in the late fall in the mountains, and by eight o'clock, where there had been rain before, there was now a thin sheeting of ice over everything. Very thin. You know the kind. Rails and telegraph wires glistening like the decorations on a Christmas tree. Very pretty. And also very nasty, running on a mountain grade. Likewise, the rain, in a way rain has, had dripped from the car roofs to the platforms. The local did not boast any closed vestibules and had also been blown upon the car steps with the sweep of the wind, and having frozen, it stayed there. Not a very serious matter, annoying, perhaps, but not serious, demanding a little extra caution, that was all. Toddles was in high fettle that night. He had been getting on famously of late, even Bob Donkin had admitted it. Toddles, with his stack of books and magazines, an unusually big one, for a number of the new periodicals were out that day, was dreaming rosy dreams to himself as he started from the door of the first-class smoker to the door of the first-class coach. In another hour now he'd be up in the dispatcher's room at Big Cloud for his nightly sitting with Bob Donkin. He could see Bob Donkin there now, and he could hear the big dispatcher growl at him in his bluff way. "'Use your head.' Use your head, Hoogan. It was always Hoogan, never Toddles. Use your head. Donkin was everlastingly drumming that into him, for the dispatcher used to confront him suddenly with imaginary and hair-raising emergencies and demand Toddles' instant solution. Toddles realized that Donkin was getting to the heart of things and that some day he, Toddles, would be a great dispatcher, like Donkin. Use your head, Hoogan. That's the way Donkin talked. Anybody can learn a key, but that doesn't make a railroad man out of him. It's the man, when trouble comes, who can think quick and think right. Use your... Toddles stepped out on the platform and walked on ice. But that wasn't Toddles' undoing. The trouble with Toddles was that he was walking on air at the same time. It was treacherous running. They were nosing a curve, and in the cab, Kennard at the throttle checked with a little jerk at the air, and with the jerk Toddles slipped, and with the slip the center of gravity of the stack of periodicals shifted, and then bulged ominously from the middle. Toddles grabbed at them, and his heels went out from under him. He ricocheted down the steps, snatched desperately at the handrail, missed it, shot out from the train, and head, heels, arms, and body, going every which way at once, rolled over and over down the embankment and starting from the point of Toddle's departure from the train, the right-of-way for a hundred yards was strewn with the latest magazines and new books just out today. Toddles lay there, a little curled, huddled heap, motionless in the darkness. The taillights of the local disappeared. No one aboard would miss Toddles until they got into Big Cloud and found him gone which is Irish for saying that no one would attempt to keep track of a newsboy's idiosyncrasies on a train. It would be asking too much of any train crew, and besides, there was no mention of it in the rules. It was a long while before Toddles stirred, a very long while before consciousness crept slowly back to him. Then he moved, tried to get up, and fell back with a quick, sharp cry of pain. He lay still, then, for a moment, his ankle hurt him frightfully, and his back, and his shoulder, too. He put his hand to his face where something seemed to be trickling warm, and brought it away wet. Toddles, grim little warrior, tried to think. They hadn't been going very fast when he fell off. If they had, he would have been killed. As it was, he was hurt, badly hurt, and his head swam, nauseating him. Where was he? Was he near any help? He'd have to get help somewhere, or 
or with the cold and and everything he'd probably die out there before morning toddles shouted out again and again perhaps his voice was too weak to carry very far anyway there was no reply he looked up at the top of the embankment clamped his teeth and started to crawl if he got up there perhaps he could tell where he was it had taken toddles a matter of seconds to roll down it took him ten minutes of untold agony to get up then he dashed his hand across his eyes where the blood was and cried a little with the surge of relief east down the track only a few yards away the green eye of a switch lamp winked at him where there was a switch lamp there was a siding and where there was a siding there was promise of a station toddles with a sudden uplift upon him got to his feet and started along the track two steps and went down again he couldn't walk the pain was more than he could bear his right ankle his left shoulder and his back hopping only made it worse it was easier to crawl and so toddles crawled it took him a long time even to pass the switch light the pain made him weak his senses seemed to trail off giddily every now and then and he'd find himself lying flat and still beside the track it was a white drawn face that toddles lifted up each time he started on again miserably white except where the blood kept trickling from his forehead and then toddles heart stout as it was seemed to snap he had reached the station platform wondering vaguely why the little building that loomed ahead was dark and now it came to him in a flash as he recognized the station it was cassill's siding and there was no night man at cassill's siding the switch lights were lit before the day man left of course everything swam before toddles eyes there, there there was no help here and yet yet perhaps desperate hope came again perhaps there might be the pain was terrible all over him and and he got so weak now but it wasn't far to the door toddles squirmed along the platform and reached the door finally only to find it shut and fastened, and then Toddles fainted on the threshold. When Toddles came to himself again, he thought at first that he was up in the dispatcher's room at Big Cloud with Bob Donkin pounding away on the battered old key they used to practice with. Only there seemed to be something the matter with the key, and it didn't sound as loud as it usually did. It seemed to come from a long way off, somehow. And then, besides, Bob was working it faster than he had ever done before when they were practicing. Hold second, second something, Toddles couldn't make it out. Then the seventeen, yes, he knew that, that was the life and death. Bob was going pretty quick, though, then, C.S., 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 Toddles' brain fumbled a bit over that. And then it came to him, C.S. was the call for Cassiel's siding, Cassiel's siding. Toddles' head came up with a jerk. A little cry burst from Toddles' lips, and his brain cleared. He wasn't at Big Cloud at all. He was at Cassill's siding, and he was hurt, and that was the sounder inside, calling, calling frantically for Cassill's siding, where he was. The life and death, the seventeen. It sent a thrill through Toddles' pain-twisted spine. He wriggled to the window. It, too, was closed, of course, but he could hear better there. The sounder was babbling madly. Hold second. He missed it again, and as on top of it the seventeen came pleading, frantic, urgent, he wrung his hands. Hold second. He got it this time. Number two. Toddles' first impulse was to smash in the window and reach the key. And then, like a dash of cold water over him, Duncan's words seemed to ring in his ears, Use your head. With the seventeen, it meant a matter of minutes, perhaps even seconds. Why smash the window? Why waste the moment required to do it simply to answer the call? The order stood for itself. Hold second number two. That was the second section of the limit at eastbound. Hold her. How? There was nothing, not a thing to stop her with. Use your head, said Donkin in a faraway voice to Toddles' wobbling brain. Toddles looked up the track, west where he had come from, to where the switch-light twinkled green at him, 
and with a little sob he started to drag himself back along the platform. If he could throw the switch, it could throw the light from green to red, and the limited would take the siding. But the switch was a long way off. Toddles half fell, half bumped from the end of the platform to the right away. He cried to himself with low moans as he went along. He had the heart of a fighter and grit to the last tissue. But he needed it all now, needed it all to stand the pain and fight the weakness that kept swirling over him in flashes. On he went, on his hands and knees, slithering from tie to tie, and from one tie to the next was a great distance. The life and death, the dispatcher's call, he seemed to hear it yet, throbbing, throbbing on the wire. On he went, up the track, and the green eye of the lamp, winking at him, drew nearer, and then suddenly, clear and mellow, through the mountains, caught up and echoed far and near, came the notes of a chime whistle ringing down the gorge. Fear came upon Toddles then, and a great sob shook him. That was the limited coming now. Toddles' fingers dug into the ballast, and he hurried. That is, in bitter pain, he tried to crawl a little faster, and as he crawled he kept his eyes straining up the track. She wasn't in sight yet around the curve. Not yet, anyway. Another foot. Only another foot, and he would reach the siding switch. In time, in plenty of time. Again the sob, but now in a burst of relief that for the moment made him forget his hurts. He was in time! He flung himself at the switch lever, tugged upon it, and then, trembling, every ounce of remaining strength seeming to ooze from him, he covered his face with his hands. It was locked! Padlocked! Came a rumble now, a distant roar, growing louder and louder, reverberating down the canyon walls, louder and louder, nearer and nearer. Hold second number two! Hold second number two! The seventeen, the life and death, pleading with him to hold number two! And she was coming now, coming, and, and the switch was locked! The deadly nausea racked Toddles again. There was nothing to do now, nothing! He couldn't stop her, couldn't stop her. He'd, he'd tried very hard, and, and he couldn't stop her now. He took his hands from his face and stole a glance up the track, afraid almost with the horror that was upon him to look. She hadn't swung the curve yet, but she would in a minute, and compounding down the stretch at fifty miles an hour, shoot by him like a rocket to where, somewhere ahead in some form, he did not know what, only knew that it was there, death and ruin and... Use your head, snapped Duncan's voice to his consciousness. Toddle's eyes were on the light above his head. It blinked red at him as he stood on the track facing it. The green rays were shooting up and down the line. He couldn't swing the switch, but the lamp was there, and there was the red side to show just by turning it. He remembered then that the lamp fitted into a socket at the top of the switch stand and could be lifted off, if he could reach it. It wasn't very high, for an ordinary-sized man. For an ordinary-sized man had to get at it to trim and fill it daily. Only Toddles wasn't an ordinary-sized man. It was just nine or ten feet above the rails, just a standard siding switch. Toddles gritted his teeth and climbed upon the base of the switch, and nearly fainted as his ankle swung against the rod. A foot above the base was a footrest for a man to stand on and reach up for the lamp, and Toddles drew himself up and got his foot on it, and then at his full height the tips of his fingers only just touched the bottom of the lamp. Toddles cried aloud, and the tears streamed down his face now. Oh, if he weren't hurt, if he could only shin up another foot, but but it was all he could do to hang on there where he was. What was that? He turned his head up the track, sweeping in a great circle as it swung the curve, a headlight's glare cut through the night, and Toddles shinned the foot. He tugged and tore at the lamp, tugged and tore at it, loosened it, lifted it from its socket, sprawled and wriggled with it to the ground, and turned the red side of the lamp against second number two. The quick short blasts of a whistle answered, then the crunch and grind and scream of biting brake shoes, and the big mountain racer, the 1012, pulling the second section of the Limited that night, stopped with its pilot nosing a diminutive figure in a torn and silver-buttoned uniform, whose hair was clotted red, and whose face was covered with blood and dirt. 
Masters, the engineer, and Pete Leroy, his fireman, swung from the gangways. Kelly, the conductor, came running up from the forward coach. Kelly shoved his lamp into Toddles' face and whistled low under his breath. Toddles, he gasped, and then quick as a steel trap, what's wrong? I don't know, said Toddles weakly. There's, there's something wrong. Get into the clear on the siding. Something's wrong, repeated Kelly, and you don't. But Masters cut the conductor short with a grab at the other's arm that was like the shutting of a vice, and then bolted for his engine like a gopher for its hole. From down the track came the heavy, grumbling roar of a freight. Everybody flew then, and there was quick work done in the next half minute, and none too quickly done. The Limited was no more than on the siding when the fast freight rolled her long streak of flats, boxes, and gondolas thundering by. And while she passed, Toddles on the platform stammered out his story to Kelly. Kelly didn't say anything, then. With the express messenger and a brakeman carrying Toddles, Kelly kicked in the station door and set his lamp down on the operator's table. "'Hold me up,' whispered Toddles, and while they held him he made the dispatcher's call. Big Cloud answered him on the instant. Haltingly, Toddles reported the second section in and the freight out. Only he did it very slowly, and he couldn't think very much more for things were going black. He got an order for the Limited to run to Blind River, and told Kelly and got the complete, and then Big Cloud asked who was on the wire, and Toddles answered that in a mechanical sort of a way without quite knowing what he was doing, and went limp in Kelly's arms. And as Toddles answered, back in Big Cloud, Regan, the sweat still standing out in great beads on his forehead, fierce now in the revulsion of relief, glared over Donkin's left shoulder as Donkin's left hand scribbled on a pad what was coming over the wire. Regan glared fiercely, then he sputtered, "'Who in hell's Christopher Hyslop Hogan, hm?' Donkin's lips had a queer smile on them. "'Toddles,' he said. Regan sat down heavily in his chair. "'What?' demanded the super. "'Toddles,' said Donkin. "'I've been trying to drum a little railroad into him on the key.' Regan wiped his face. He looked helplessly from Donkin to the super and then back to Donkin. But, but what's he doing at Castle Siding? How'd he get there? Hmm? Hmm? How'd he get there? I don't know, said Donkin, his fingers rattling his Castle Siding call again. He doesn't answer any more. We'll have to wait for the story till they make Blind River, I guess. And so they waited. And presently at Blind River, Kelly dictating to the operator, not Beale, Beale's day man, told the story. It lost nothing in the telling. Kelly wasn't that kind of a man. He told them what Toddles had done, and he left nothing out, and he added that they had Toddles on a mattress in the baggage car with a doctor they had discovered among the passengers looking after him. At the end, Carlton tamped down the dottle in the bowl of his pipe thoughtfully with his forefinger and glanced at Donkin. "'Got along far enough to take a station key somewhere?' he inquired casually. "'He's made a pretty good job of it as the night operator at Castle's.' Donkin was smiling. "'Not yet,' he said. "'No?' Carlton's eyebrows went up. "'Well, let him come in here with you, then, till he has. "'And when you say he's ready, we'll see what we can do. "'I guess it's coming to him. "'And I guess—' He shifted his glance to the master mechanic. I guess we'll uh, go down and meet number two when she comes in, Tommy. Regan grinned. With our hats in our hands, said the big-hearted master mechanic. Donkin shook his head. Don't you do it, he said. I don't want him to get a swelled head. Carlton stared, and Regan's hand, reaching for his back pocket for his chewing, stopped midway. Donkin was still smiling. I'm going to make a railroad man out of Toddles, he said. End of chapter one, part two. Chapter two, part one of The Night Operator by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Night Operator, chapter two, part one. Owsley, 
and the 1601. His name was Owsley, Jake Owsley, and he was a railroad man before ever he came to Big Cloud and the Hill Division, before ever the Hill Division was even advanced to the blueprint stage, before steel had ever spider-webbed the stubborn Rockies, before the Herculean task of bridging a continent was more than a thought in even the most ambitious minds. Owsley was an engineer, and he came from the east, when they broke ground at Big Cloud for a start toward the western goal through the mighty range, a comparatively young man, thirty or thereabouts. Then, inch by inch and foot by foot, Owsley, with his ballast cars and his boxes and his flats bumping material behind him, followed the construction gangs as they burrowed and blasted and trestled their way along, day in, day out, month in, month out, until the years went by. And they were through the Rockies, with the coast and the blue of the Pacific in sight. First over every bridge and culvert, first through every cut, first through every tunnel shorn in the bitter gray rock of the mountain sides, the pilot of Owsley's engine nosed its way, and when the rough of the work was over, and in the hysteria of celebration, the toll of lives, the hardships, and the cost were forgotten for the moment, and the directors and their guests crowded the cab and perched on running boards and footplates till you couldn't see the bunting they draped the engine with, and the mahogany coaches behind looked like the striped sticks of candy the kids buy on account of more bunting and then some, and uh, the local band they'd brought along from Big Cloud got the mouthpieces of their trombones and cornets mixed up with the necks of champagne bottles, and the Indian braves squatted gravely at different points along the trackside and thought their white brothers had gone mad. Owsley was at the throttle for the first through run over the division. It was Owsley's due. Then other years went by, and the steel was shaken down into the permanent right-of-way that it is an engineering marvel today, and Owsley still held a throttle on a through run, just kept growing a little older, that was all, but one of the best of them for all that, steadier than the younger men, wise in experience, and with a love for his engine that was like the love of a man for a woman. It's a strange thing, perhaps, a love like that. But, strange or not, there was never an engineer worth his salt who hasn't had it. Some more than others, of course, as some men's love for a woman is deeper than others. With Owsley, it came pretty near being the whole thing. And it was queer enough to see him when they'd change his engine to give him a newer and more improved type for a running mate. He'd refuse point-blank at first to be separated from the obsolete engine that was either carted for some local jerk-water, mixed freight run, or for a construction job somewhere. Leave her with me, he'd say to Regan, the master mechanic. Leave me with her. You can give my run to someone else, Regan, do you mind? It, it's little I care for the swell run. Me and the old girl sticks. I'll have nothing else. But the bluff, fat, big-hearted, good-natured little master mechanic knew his man, and he knew an engineer when he saw one. Regan would no more have thought of letting Owsley get away from the Imperial's throttle than he would have thought of putting call boys in the cabs to run the engines. Hmph, he would say, blinking fast at Owsley. Feel that way, do you? Well, then, maybe it's about time you quit altogether. I didn't offer you your choice, did I? Now, you take the Imperial with what I give you to take her with, or take nothing. Think it over. And Dowsley, perforce, had to uh, think it over. And, perforce, he stayed on the limited run. Came then the day when changes in engine types were not so frequent, and a fair maximum in machine design efficiency had been obtained. And Owsley came to love, more than he had ever loved any engine before, his big, powerful 1600-class racer, with its four pairs of massive drivers that took the curves with the grace of a circling bird that laughed in glee at anything lower than a 3% grade and tackled the fives with no more than a grunt of disdain. Owsley and the 1601, right from the start, 
clipped fifty-five minutes off the running time of the Imperial Limited through the Rockies, where before it had been nip and tuck to make the old schedule anywhere near the dot. For three years it was Owsley in the 1601. For three years, east and west through the mountains, and a smile in the roundhouse at him as he nursed and cuddled and groomed his big flyer in from a run. Not now. They don't smile now about it. It was Owsley and the 1601 for three years, and at the end it was still Owsley and the 1601. The two are coupled together. They never speak of one on the Hill Division without the other. Owsley and the 1601. Owsley. One of the old guard who answered the roll call at the birth of the Hill Division. Forty years a railroader, call boy at ten, twenty years of service counting the construction period on the Hill Division. Straight and upright as a young sapling at fifty-odd, with a swing through the gangway that the younger men tried to imitate, hair short-cropped, a little grizzled, gray steady eyes, a beard whose color, once brown, was nondescript, kind of shading tawny and gray and streaks, a slim little man, overalled and jumpered with greasy peaked cap, and wifeless, without kith or kin save his engine, the star boarder at Mrs. McCann's short order house, liked by everybody, known by everybody on the division down to the last Polack construction hand, quiet, no bluster about him, full of good-humored fun, ready to take his part or do his share in anything going, from a lodge minstrel show to sitting up all night and playing trained nurse to anybody that needed one. That was Owsley. Oh, you and your millions who ride in trains by day and night, do you ever give a thought to the men into whose keeping you hand your lives? Does it ever occur to you that they are not just part of the equipment of iron and wood and steel and rolling things to be accepted callously, as bought and paid for with the strip of ticket that you hold, animate only in that you may voice your grumblings and your discontent at some delay that saves you probably from being hurled into eternity, while you chafe impatiently and childishly at something you know nothing about, that they, like you, are human, too, with hopes achieved and aspirations shattered, and plans and interests in life? Have you ever thought that there was a human side to railroading, and that... But <clears throat> we were speaking of Owsley, Jake Owsley. Perhaps you'll understand a little better further on along the right away. Elbow Bend, were it not for the insurmountable obstacles that Dame Nature had seen fit to place there, the bed of the Glacier River on one side and a sheer rock base of mountain on the other, would have been a black mark against the record of the engineering corps who built the station. Speaking generally, it is not good railroad practice to put a station on a curve, when it can be helped. Elbow Bend, the whole of it, main line and siding, made a curve, that's how it got its name, and yet, in a way, it wasn't the curve that was to blame, though, too, in a way, it was. Owsley had a patched eye that night from a bit of steel that had got into it in the afternoon, nothing much, but a patch on it to keep the cold and the sweep of the wind out. It was the eastbound run, and to make up for the loss of time a slow order over new construction work back a dozen miles or so had cost him, the 1601 was hitting a pretty fast clip as he whistled for elbow bend. Owsley checked just a little as he nosed the curve. The Imperial Limited made no stop at Elbow Bend. And then, as the 1601 sort of got her footing, so to speak, on the long bend, he opened her out again, and the storm of exhausts from her short, stubby stack went echoing through the mountains like the play of artillery. The light of the West End siding switch flashed by like a scintillating gem in the darkness. Brannigan, Owsley's fireman, pulled his door, shooting the cab and the heavens full of leaping fiery red, and swung to the tender for a shovelful of coal. Owsley, crouched a little forward in his seat, his body braced against the cant of the mogul on the curve, was feeling the throttle with a careful hand, and he peered ahead through the cab glass. Came the station lights, the black bulk of a locomotive cascading steam from her safety on the siding, and then the thundering reverberation as the 1601 began to sweep past a long curving line of boxes, flats, and gondolas 
the end of which Owsley could not see, for the curve. Owsley relaxed a little. That was right. Extra number 49 West was to cross him at Elbow Bend, and she was on the siding as she should be. His headlight, streaming out at a tangent to the curve, played its way kaleidoscopically along the sides of the string of freights, now edging the roof of a boxcar, now opening a hole to the gray rock of the cut when a flat or two intervened, and then, sudden, quick as doom, with a yell from his fireman ringing in his ears, Owsley, his jaws clamping like a steel trap, flung his arm forward, jamming the throttle shut, while with the other hand he grabbed at the air. Owsley had seen it, too, as quick as Brannigan, a figure, arms waving frantically, for a fleeting second strangely silhouetted in the dancing headlight's glare on the roof of one of the boxcars. A wild shout from the man, fluttering, indistinguishable, reached them as they roared by, then the grind and scream of brake shoes as the air went on, the answering shudder vibrating through the cab of the big racer, the meeting clash of buffer plates echoing down the length of the train behind, and a queer obstructing blackness dead ahead ere the headlight, tardy in its sweep, could point the way. But Owsley knew now, too late. Brannigan screamed in his ear. She ain't in the clear! He screamed. It's a swipe! She ain't in the clear! He screamed again and took a flying leap through the offside gangway. Owsley never turned his head, only held there, grim-faced, tight-lipped, facing what was to come, facing it with a clear head, quick brain, doing what he could to lessen the disaster, for forty years had schooled him to face emergency, Owsley, for forty years with his record, until that moment, as clean and unsmirched as the day he started as a kid calling train crews back in the little division town on the pen in the Far East. Strange it should come to Owsley, the one man of all you'd never think it would. It's hard to understand the running orders of the great train master sometimes, isn't it? And sometimes it doesn't help much to realize that we never will understand this side of the great divide does it? The headlight caught it now, seemed to gloat upon it in a flood of blazing, insolent light, the rear cars of the freight crawling frantically from the main line to the siding, then the pitiful yellow from the cupola of the caboose, the light from below filtering up through the windows. It seared into Owsley's brain lightning quick, but vivid in every detail in a horrible, fascinating way. It was a second, the fraction of a second, since Brannigan had jumped. It might have been an hour." The front of the caboose seemed to leap suddenly at the 1601, seemed to rise up in the air and hurl itself at the straining engine as though in impotent fury at unwarranted attack. There was a terrific crash, the groan and rend of timber, the sickening grind and crunch as the van went to matchwood, the debris hurtling along the running boards, shattering the cab glass in flying splinters, and Owsley dropped where he stood like a log and the pony truck caught the tongue of the open switch, and with a vicious, nasty lurch that 1601 wrenched herself loose from her string of coaches, staggered like a lost and drunken soul a few yards along the ties, and turned turtle in the ditch. It was a bad spill, but it might have been worse, a great deal worse. A boxcar in the van for the junk heap, and the 1601 for the shops to repair fractures, and nobody hurt except Owsley. But they couldn't make head or tail of the cause of it. Everybody went on the carpet for it, and still it was a mystery. The main line was clear at the west end of the siding, and the switch was right, everybody was agreed on that, and it showed that way, on the face of it, and that was as it should have been. The operator at Elbow Bend swore that he had shown his red, and that it was showing when the Limited swept by. He said he knew it was going to be a close shave whether the freight, a little late, and crowding the Limited's running time, would be clear of the main line without delaying the express, and he had shown his red before even he had heard her whistle. His red was showing. The engine crew and the train crew of extra number 49 West backed the operator up. The red was showing. Brannigan, the fireman, didn't count as a witness. The only light he'd seen at all was the West End switch light, the curve had hidden anything ahead until after he'd pulled his door and turned to the tender for coal, and by then they were past the station. And Owsley, pretty badly smashed up and in bed down in Mrs. McCann's short-order house, talked kind of queer when he got around to where he could talk at all. They asked him what color light the station semaphore was showing, and Owsley said white. White as the moon. 
That's what he said. White as the moon. And they weren't quite sure he understood what they were driving at. For a week, that's all they could make out of it. And then, with Regan scratching his head over it one day in confab with Carleton, the superintendent, it came more by chance than anything else. Blamed if I know what to make of it, he growled. Ordinary, six men's words would be the end of it. But Owsley's the best man that ever latched a throttle in our cabs, and for twenty years his record's cleaner than a baby's. What he says now don't count, because he ain't right again yet. But what you can't get away from is the fact that Owsley's not the man to have slipped a signal. Either the six of them are doing him cold to save their own skins, or, or there's something queer about it. Carleton, Royal Carleton, in his grave, quiet way, shook his head. "'We've been trying hard enough to get to the bottom of it, Tommy,' he said. "'I wish to the Lord we could. I don't think the men are lying. They tell a pretty straight story. I've been wondering about that patch Owsley had on his eye, and—' "'What's that got to do with it?' cut in the blunt little master mechanic, who made no bones about his fondness for the engineer. "'He isn't blind in the other, is he?' Carleton stared at the master mechanic for a moment, pulling ruminatively at his briar. Then, they were in the super's office at the time, his fist came down with a sudden bang upon the desk. "'I believe you've got it, Tommy!' he exclaimed. "'Believe I've got it!' echoed Regan, and his hand halfway to his mouth with his plug of chewing stopped in midair. "'Got what? I said he wasn't blind in the other, and neither is he. You know that as well as I do.' "'Wait,' said Carleton. It's very rare, I know, but it seems to me I've heard of it. Wait a minute, Tommy. He was leaning over from his chair and twirling the little revolving bookcase beside the desk as he spoke. Not a large library. It was Carleton's, just a few technical books and his cherished Britannica. He pulled out a volume of the encyclopedia, laid it upon the desk, and began to turn the leaves. Yes, here it is, he said after a moment. Listen. And he commenced to read rapidly. The most common form of Daltonism, that's colorblindness, you know, Tommy, depends on the absence of the red sense. Great additions to our knowledge of this subject, if only in confirmation of results already deduced from theory, have been obtained in the last few years by Holmgren, who has experimented on two persons, each of whom was found to have one colorblind eye, the other being nearly normal. Colorblind, sputtered the master mechanic, in one eye said Carleton, sort of as though he was turning a problem over in his mind. That would account for, for it all, Tommy. As far as I know, one doesn't go color blind. One is born that way. And if this is what's at the bottom of it, Owsley's been color blind all his life in one eye, and probably didn't know what was the matter. That would account for his passing the tests, and would account for what happened at Elbow Bend. It was the patch that did it. You remember what he said? The light was white as the moon. "'And he's out!' stormed Regan. "'Out for keeps after forty years. "'Say, do you know what this'll mean to Owsley? "'Do you? Do, do you? "'It'll be hell for him, Carleton. "'He thinks more of his engine than a woman does of her child.' Carleton closed the volume and replaced it mechanically in the bookcase. Regan's teeth met in his plug and jerked savagely at the tobacco. "'I wish to blazes you hadn't read that,' he muttered fiercely. What's to be done now? I'm afraid there's only one thing to be done, Carleton answered gravely. Sentiment doesn't let us out. There's too many lives at stake every time he takes out an engine. He'll have to try the color test with a patch over the same eye he had on that night. Perhaps, after all, I'm wrong, and— He's out, said the master mechanic gruffly. He's out. I don't need any test to know that now. <sighs> That's what's the matter, and no other thing on earth. It's rough, damn rough, ain't it, after forty years? And Regan, with a short laugh, strode to the window and stood staring out at the choked railroad yards below him. And Regan was right. Three weeks later, when he got out of bed, Owsley took the color test under the queerest conditions that ever a railroad man took it, with his right eye bandaged, and failed utterly. But Owsley didn't quite seem to understand, 
and little Dr. McTurk, the company surgeon, was badly worried and had been all along. Owsley was a long way from being the same Owsley he was before the accident. Not physically. That way he was shaping up pretty well, but his head seemed to bother him. He seemed to have lost his grip on a whole lot of things. They gave him the test, more to settle the point in their own minds, but they knew before they gave it to him that it wasn't much use as far as he was concerned one way or the other. There was more than a mere matter of color wrong with Owsley now. And maybe that was the kindest thing that could have happened to him. Maybe it made it easier for him, since the colors barred him anyway from ever pulling a throttle again, not to understand. They tried to tell him he hadn't passed the color test. Regan tried to tell him in a clumsy, big-hearted way, breaking it as easy as he could, and Owsley laughed as though he were pleased. Just laughed, and, and with a glance at the clock and a jerky pull at his watch for comparison, a way he had of doing, walked out of Riley's, the trainmaster's office, and started across the tracks for the roundhouse. Owsley's head wasn't working right. It was as though the mechanism was running down the memory kind of tapering off. But the 1601, his engine, stuck. And it was train time when he walked out of Riley's office that afternoon, the first afternoon he'd been out of bed in Mrs. McCann's motherly hands since the night at Elbow Bend. Perhaps you'll smile a little tolerantly at this, and perhaps you'll say the story's cooked. Well, perhaps. If you think that way about it, you'll probably smile more broadly still, and with the same grounds for a smile before we make division and sign the train register at the end of the run. Anyway, that afternoon, as Owsley, out for the first time, walked a little shakily across the turntable and through the big engine doors into the roundhouse, the 1601 was out for the first time herself from the repair shops, and for the first time since the accident was standing on the pit, blowing from a full head of steam and ready to move out and couple on for the mountain run west as soon as the Imperial Limited came in off the Prairie Division from the east. Is it a coincidence to smile at? Yes? Well, then there is more of the same humor to come. They tell the story on the Hill Division this way, those hard, grimy-handed men of the Rockies, in the cab, in the caboose, in the smoker, if you get intimate enough with the conductor or brakeman, in the roundhouse and in the section shanty, but they never smile themselves when they tell it. Paxley, big as two of Owsley, promoted from a local passenger run, had been given the Imperial and the 1601. He was standing by the front end, chatting with Clara Hugh, the Turner, as Owsley came in. Owsley didn't appear to notice either of the men, didn't answer either of them as they greeted him cheerily. His face, that had grown white from his illness, was tinged a little red with excitement, and his eyes seemed trying to take in every single detail of the big mountain racer all at once. He walked along to the gangway, his shoulders sort of bracing further back all the time, and then with the old-time swing he disappeared into the cab. He was out again in a minute with a long-spouted oil can, and just as he always did, started in for an oil around. Paxley and Clara Hugh looked at each other, and Paxley sort of fumbled aimlessly with the peak of his cap, while Clara Hugh couldn't seem to get the straps of his overalls adjusted comfortably. Brannigan, Owsley's old fireman, joined them from the other side of the engine. None of them spoke. Owsley went on oiling, making the round slowly, carefully, head and shoulders hidden completely at times as he leaned in over the rod, poking at the motion gear. And Regan, who had followed Owsley, coming in, got the thing in a glance and swore fiercely deep down in his throat. Not much to choke strong men up and throw them into the dead center? Well, perhaps not. Just a railroad man for forty years, just an engineer, and the best of them all, out. Owsley finished his round and instead of climbing into the cab through the opposite gangway, came back to the front end and halted before Jim Clarahue. "'I see you got that injector valve packed at last,' said he approvingly. "'She looks cleaner under the guard plates than I've seen her for a long time, too. "'Give me the table, Jim.' None of them answered. 
Regan said afterward that he felt as though there'd been a head-on smash somewhere inside of him. But Owsley didn't seem to expect any answer. He went on down the side of the locomotive, went in through the gangway, and the next instant the steam came purring into the cylinders, just warming her up for a moment, as Owsley always did before he moved out of the roundhouse. It was Clara Hugh, then, who spoke, with a kind of catchy jerk. Uh, she's, uh, she's stiff from the shops. He, he's strong enough to hold her on the table. Regan looked at Paxley and tugged at his scraggly little brown mustache. "'You'll have to get him out of there, Bob,' he said gruffly to hide his emotion. "'Get him out, gently.' The steam was coming now into the cylinders with a more businesslike rush, and Paxley jumped for the cab. As he climbed in, Brannigan followed, and in a sort of helpless way hung in the gangway behind him. Owsley was standing up, his hand on the throttle, and evidently puzzled a little at the stiffness of the reversing lever that refused to budge on the segment with what strength he had in one hand to give it. Paxley reached over and tried to loosen Owsley's hand on the throttle. "'Let me take her, Jake,' he said. Owsley stared at him for a moment in mingled perplexity and irritation. "'What in blazes would I let you take her for?' he snapped suddenly, and attempted to shoulder Paxley aside. "'Get out of here, and mind your own business. Get out!' He snatched his wrist away from Paxley's fingers and gave a jerk at the throttle, and the 1601 began to move. The table wasn't set, and Paxley had no time for hesitation. More roughly than he had any wish to do it, he brushed Owsley's hand from the throttle and latched the throttle shut. And then, quick as a cat, Owsley was on him. It wasn't much of a fight, hardly a fight at all. Owsley, from three weeks on his back, was dropping weak, but Owsley snatched up a spanner that was lying on the seat and smashed Paxley with it between the eyes. Paxley was a big man physically, and a bigger man still where it counts most and doesn't show. With the blood streaming down his face and half-blinded, regardless of the blows that Owsley kept trying to rain upon him, he picked the engineer up in his arms like a baby, and, with Brannigan dropping off the gangway and helping, got Owsley to the ground. End of Chapter 2, Part 1《Chapter Two, Part Two of the Night Operator by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Night Operator, Chapter Two, Part Two. Owsley hadn't been fit for excitement or exertion of that kind, for any kind of excitement or exertion. They took him back to his boarding house, and Dr. McTurk screwed his eyes up over him in the funny way he had when things looked critical and Mrs. McCann nursed him daytimes, and Carleton and Regan and two or three others took turns sitting up with him nights, for a month. Then Owsley began to mend again, and began to talk of getting back on the limited run with the 1601, always the 1601, and most times he talked pretty straight, too, as straight as any of the rest of them, only his memory seemed to keep that queer sort of haze over it. Up to the time of the accident it seemed all right, but after that things blurred woefully. Regan, Carleton, and Dr. McTurk went into committee over it in the super's office one afternoon just before Owsley was out of bed again. "'What do you say, hmm? What do you say, Doc?' demanded Regan. Dr. McTurk, scientific and professional in every inch of his little body, lined his eyebrows up into a ferocious black streak across his forehead, and talked medicine in medical terms into the superintendent and the master mechanic for a good five minutes. When he had finished, Carleton's brows were puckered too. His face was a little blank, and he tapped the edge of his desk with the end of his pencil somewhat helplessly. Regan tugged at both ends of his mustache and sputtered, "'What the blazes!' he growled. Give it to us in plain railroading. Has he got rights through, or hasn't he? Does he get better, or does he not? Hmm? I don't know, I tell you, retorted Dr. McTurk. I don't know, and that's flat. I've told you why a minute ago. I don't know whether he'll ever be better in his head than he is now. Otherwise, he'll come around all right. Well, what's to be done? inquired Carleton. Eh, he's got to work for a living, I suppose, hmm? Dr. McTurk answered, and he can't run an engine any more on account of the colors, no matter what happens. That's a state of affairs, isn't it? 
Carlton didn't answer. Regan only mumbled under his breath. "'Well, then,' submitted Dr. McTurk, "'the best thing for him, temporarily at least, uh, to build him up, is fresh air and plenty of it. Give him a job somewhere, out in the open.' Carlton's eyebrows went up. He looked across at Regan questioningly. "'He wouldn't take it,' said Regan slowly. "'There's nothing to anything for Owsley but the 1601.' "'Wouldn't take it,' snapped the little doctor. "'He's got to take it. "'And if you care half what you pretend you do for him, "'you got to see that he does.' "'How about uh, construction work with McCann?' suggested Carlton. "'He likes McCann, and he's lived at their place for years now.' "'Just the thing,' declared Dr. McTurk heartily. "'Couldn't be better.' Carlton looked at Regan again. "'You can handle him better than anyone else, Tommy. "'Suppose you see what you can do.' And speaking of the 1601, how would it do to tell him what's happened in the last month? Maybe he wouldn't think so much of her as he does now. No, exclaimed Dr. McTurk quickly. Don't you do it? No, said Regan, shaking his head. It would make him worse. He'd blame it on Paxley and would have trouble on our hands before you could bat an eyelash. Yes, perhaps you're right, agreed Carlton. Well, then... Try him on the construction tack, Tommy. And so Regan went that afternoon from the super's office over to Mrs. McCann's short order house and up to Owsley's room. Well, how's Jake today? He inquired in his bluff, cheery way, drawing a chair up beside the bed. I'm fine, Regan, said Owsley earnestly. Fine. What day is this? Thursday, Regan told him. Yes, said Owsley. That's right. Thursday. Well, you can put me down to take the old 1601 out Monday night. I'm figuring to get back on the run Monday night, Regan. Regan ran his hand through his short-cropped hair, twisted a little uneasily in his chair, and coughed to fill in the gap. I wouldn't be in a hurry about it if I were you, Jake, he said. In fact, that's what I came over to have a little talk with you about. We don't think you're strong enough yet for the cab. Who don't? demanded Owsley antagonistically. Well, the, the doctor and Carlton and myself, we, we were just speaking about it. Why ain't I? demanded Owsley again. Why, good Lord, Jake, said Regan patiently. You've been sick, dashed near two months. A man can't expect to get out of bed after a layoff like that and start right in again before he gets his strength back. You know that as well as I do. Maybe I do, and uh, maybe I don't said Owsley, a little uncertainly. Uh, how am I going to get strong? Well, replied Regan, the doc says open-air work to build you up, and we were thinking uh, you might like to put in a month, say, with Bill McCann up on the Elk River work, helping him boss Polax, for instance. Owsley didn't speak for a moment. He seemed to be puzzling something out, and then still, in a puzzled way, and what about after the month? Oh, why then, said Regan, then he reached for his hip pocket and his plug, pulled out the plug, picked the heart-shaped tin tag off with his thumbnail, decided not to take a bite, and put the black strap back in his pocket again. Why then, said he, you'll, you ought to be all right again. Owsley sat up in bed. You're playing straight with me, Regan, he asked slowly. Oh, sure, said Regan gruffly, sure I am. Owsley passed his hand two or three times across his eyes. "'I don't seem to get the signals right on what's happened,' he said. "'I guess I've been pretty sick. I, I guess I had a feeling a minute ago that, that you were trying to sidetrack me. But if you say you ain't, I believe you. I ain't going to be sidetracked. When I quit for keeps, I quit in the cab with my boots on. No way else. I'll tell you something, Regan. When I go out, I'm going out with my hand on the throttle, same as it's been for more than twenty years. And me and the old 1601 were going out together. That's the way I want to go when the time comes. That's the way I'm going. I've known it for a long time. But how do you mean you've known it for a long time? Regan swallowed a lump in his throat as he asked the question. Owsley's mind seemed to be wandering a little. I don't know, 
said Owsley, and his hand crept to his head again. I don't know. I, I just know. Then abruptly, I got to get strong for the old 1601, ain't I? That's right. I'll go up there. Only if you give me your word, I get the 1601 back after the month. Regan's eyes from the floor lifted and met Owsley's steadily. You bet, Jake, said he. Give me your hand on it, said Owsley happily, and Regan gripped the engineer's hand. Regan left the room a moment or two after that, and on his way downstairs he brushed the back of his hand across his eyes. What the hell, he growled to himself. I had to lie to him, didn't I? And so, on the Monday following, Owsley went up to the new Elk River road work, and, but just a moment, we've overrun our holding orders a bit, and we've got to back for the siding. The 1601 crosses us here. Superstition is a queer thing, isn't it? Speaking generally, we look on it somewhat from the viewpoint of the old adage that all men are mortal, save ourselves. That is, we can accept, with more or less tolerant condescension, the existence of superstition in others, and with more or less tolerant condescension put it down to ignorance in others. But we're not superstitious ourselves, so we've got to have something better to go on than that, as far as the 1601 is concerned. Well, the 1601 was pretty badly shaken up that night in the spill at Elbow Bend, and when they overhauled her in the shops while well, they made her look like new, perhaps they missed something down deep in her vitals and the doing of it. Perhaps she was weakened and strained where they didn't know she was. Perhaps they didn't get clean to the bottom of all her troubles. Perhaps they made a bad job of a job that looked all right under the fresh paint and the gold leaf. There's nothing superstitious about that, is there? It's logical and reasonable enough to satisfy even the most hypercritical crank amongst us anti-superstitionists, isn't it? But that doesn't go in the cabs and the roundhouses and the section shanties on the Hill Division. You could talk and reason out there along that line until you were blue in the face from shortness of breath, and they'd listen to you while they wiped their hands on a hunk of waste. They'd listen but they've got their own notions. It was the night at Elbow Bend that Owsley and the 1601 together first went wrong, and both went into hospital together and came out together to the day, the 1601 for her old run through the mountains, and Owsley with no other idea in life possessing his sick brain than to make the run with her. Owsley had a relapse that day, and that day... Twenty miles west of Big Cloud, the 1601 blew her cylinder head off. And from then on, while Owsley lay in bed again at Mrs. McCann's, the 1601, when she wasn't in the shops from an endless series of mishaps, was turning the hair gray on a dispatcher or two, and got most of Paxley's nerve. But what's the use of going into all the details? There was enough paper used up in the specification repair sheets going slow up a grade and around a curve that was protected with ninety-pound guardrails, her pony truck jumped the steel where a baby carriage would have held to the right of way. She broke this, she broke that, she was always breaking something, and rare was the night that she didn't limp into division, dragging the grumbling occupants of the mahogany sleepers after her with her schedule gone to smash. And then, finally, putting a clincher on it all, she ended up, when she was running fifty miles an hour, by shedding a driving wheel and nearly killing Paxley as the rod ripped through and through, tearing the right-hand side of the cab into mangled wreckage. And that finished her for the limited run. Do you recall that Owsley, too, was finished for the limited run? Superstition? You can figure it any way you like. They've got their own notions on the Hill Division. When the 1601 came out of the shops again after that, the marks of authority's disapprobation were heavy upon her. The gold leaf of the passenger flyer was gone. The big figures on the tender were only yellow paint. Regan scowled at her as they ran her into the yards. Damn her, said Regan fervently. And then as he thought of Owsley, he scowled deeper and yanked at his mustache. "'Say,' 
said Regan heavily. It's queer, ain't it? Blamed queer, huh, when you come to think of it. And so, while the 1601, disfranchised, went to hauling extra freights, kind of a misfit doing spare jobs, anything that turned up, no regular run any more, Owsley, kind of a misfit too, without any very definite duties, because there wasn't anything very definite they dared trust him with, went up on the Elk River work with Bill McCann, the husband of Mrs. McCann, who kept the short order house. Owsley told McCann, as he had told Regan, that he was only up there getting strong again for the 1601, and he went around on the construction work whistling and laughing like a schoolboy and happy as a child, getting strong again for the 1601. McCann couldn't see anything very much the matter with Owsley, except that Owsley was happy. He studied the letter Regan had sent him, and watched the engineer, and scratched at his bullet head, and blinked fast with his grey Irish eyes. Faith, said McCann, it's them that's off their chumps, not Owsley. Hark to him singing out there like a lark, and by dad, it's myself tell him so. And he did. He wrote his opinion in concise, forceful, misspelled English on the back of a requisition slip, and sent it to Regan. Regan didn't say much, just choked up a little when he read it. McCann wasn't very strong on diagnosis. It was still early spring when Owsley went to the new loop they were building around the main line to tap a bit of the country south, and the Chinook, blowing warm, had melted most of the snow, and the creeks, rivers, and sluices were running full, the busiest time in all the year for the track men and section hands. It was a summer's job, the loop, if luck was with them, and the orders were to push the work. The steel was to be down before the snow flew again. That was the way it was put up to McCann when he first moved into construction camp, a short while before Owsley joined him. "'Then give me the stuff,' said McCann. "'Shoot the material along, and don't leave me biting me fingernails for the want of it, you mind?' So the Big Cloud Yards, too, had orders, standing orders, to rush out all material for the Elk River Loop as fast as it came in from the east. In a way, of course, that was how it happened, from the standing orders. It was just the kind of work the 1601 was hanging around, waiting to do, the odd jobs, pulling the extras. Ordinarily, perhaps, somebody would have thought of it, and maybe they wouldn't have sent her out. Maybe they would. You can't operate a railroad wholly on sentiment. And there were ten cars of steel and as many more of ties and conglomerate supplies helping to choke up the big cloud yards when they should have been where they were needed a whole lot more, in McCann's construction camp. But there had been two days of bad weather in the mountains, two days of solid rain, track troubles, and troubles generally, and what with one thing and another, the motive power department had been taxed to its limit. The first chance they got in a lull of pressure, not the storm, they sent the material west with the only spare engine that happened to be in the roundhouse at the time, the 1601, and never thought of Owsley. Regan might have, would have, if he had known it, but Regan didn't know it, then, Regan wasn't handling the operating. Perhaps, after all, they needn't have been in a belated hurry that day. McCann and his foreigners had done nothing but hug their shanties and listen to the rain washing the ballast away for two days and a half, until, as it got dark on that particular day, barely a week after Owsley had come to the work, they listened, by way of variation, to the chime whistle of an engine that came ringing down with the wind. McCann and Owsley shared a little shanty by themselves, and McCann was trying to initiate Owsley into the mysteries of that grand old game so dear to the hearts of Irishmen, the game of forty-five. But at the first sound of the whistle, the cards dropped from Owsley's hands, and he jumped to his feet. "'Do you hear that? Do you hear that?' he cried. "'Ah, for what of it?' inquired McCann. "'It'll be the material we be hung up for, if it weren't for the storm.' Owsley leaned across the table, his head turned a little sideways in a curious listening attitude, leaned across the table and gripped McCann's shoulders. "'It's the 1601,' he whispered. He put his finger to his lips to caution silence, and with the other hand patted McCann's shoulder confidentially. "'It's the 1601,' he whispered, and jumped for the door, out into the storm. "'For the love of Mike!' gasped McCann, struggling to his feet as the lamp flared up and out with the draft. "'Now what the devil! From this and the misfortunate way he picks up forty-five, 
maybe maybe i was wrong and maybe it's queer after us that he is and mccann was still muttering to himself as he stumbled to the door there was no sign of owsley only a string of boxes and flats backed down and rattling and bumping to a halt on the temporary track a hundred yards away then the joggling light of a trainman running through the murk and evidently hopping the engine pilot, for the light disappeared suddenly and McCann heard the locomotive moving off again. McCann couldn't see the main line or the little station they had erected there since the work began for the purpose of operating the construction trains, but he knew well enough what was going on. Off the main line, in lieu of a turntable, and to facilitate matters generally, they had built a Y into the construction camp, and the work train, in from the east, had dropped its caboose on the main line between the arms of the Y, gone ahead, backed the flats and boxes down the west end arm of the Y into the camp, left them there in front of him, and the engine, shooting off on the main line again, via the east end arm of the Y, would be heading east and had only to back up the main line and couple on the caboose for the return trip to Big Cloud. There were no empties to go back, he knew. It was raining in torrents, pitilessly, and over the gusts of wind, the thunder went racketing through the mountains like the discharge of heavy guns. McCann swore with sincerity as he gazed from the doorway, didn't like the look of it, and was minded to let Owsley go to the devil. But instead, after getting into rubber boots, a rubber coat, and lighting a lantern, he put his head down to butt the storm, goat fashion, and started out. "'Me conscience would not be clear of anything happened to the man.' communed McCann, as he battered and sloshed his way along. "'Tis one hell of a night!' McCann lost some time. He could have made a short cut over to the main line and the station, but instead, thinking Owsley might have run up the track beside the camp toward the front end of the construction train and the engine, he kept along past the string of cars. There was no Owsley, and the only result he obtained from shouting at the top of his lungs was to have the wind slap his voice back in his teeth. McCann headed then for the station. He took the west end arm of the Y, that being the nearer to his destination. Halfway across he heard the engine backing up on the main line, and a moment later saw her headlight and the red tail lights of the caboose as she coupled on. Of course it was against the rules, but rules are broken sometimes, aren't they? It was a wicked night, and the station, diminutive and makeshift as it was, looked mighty hospitable and inviting by comparison. The engine crew, Matt Dugan and Green, his fireman, thought it sized up better while they were waiting for orders than the cab of the 1601 did, and they didn't see why the train crew, McGonagall, the conductor, and his two brakemen should have any the better of it, so they left their engine and crowded into the station too. There wasn't much room left for McCann when he came in like an animated shower bath. He heard Merle, the young operator, they'd probably been guying him, snap at McGonagall. I ain't got any orders for you yet, but you better get into the clear on the Y. The Limited East is due in four minutes. See, panted McCann, see. And that was as far as he got. Matt Dugan, making a wild dash for the door, knocked the rest of his breath out of him. And after Dugan, in a mad and concerted rush, sweeping McCann along with it, the others burst through the door and out on the platform as volleying through the storm came suddenly the quick staccato bark of engine exhaust. For a moment, huddled there, trying to get the rights of it, no one spoke. Then it came in a yell from Matt Dugan. "'She's gone!' he screamed, and gulped for his breath. "'She's gone!' McCann looked and blinked and shook the rain out of his face. Two hundred yards east, down the track, and disappearing fast, were the twinkling red tail lights of the caboose. "'By the tokens of all the saints!' stammered McCann. "'Hit! Hit!' he grabbed at Matt Dugan. "'What engine is it?' It was McGonagall who answered as they crowded back inside for shelter, and answered quick, getting McCann's dropped jaw. Ah, 1601. What's wrong with you, McCann? Holy mother, stuttered McCann miserably. That settled it at Owsley. Twas the whistle, you mind. The whistle. Merle, young and hysterical, was up in the air. The limited, the limited, he burst out white-faced. There ain't three miles between them. She's coming now. McGonagall. Grizzled old veteran, cool in any emergency, whirled on the younger man. Then stop her, he drawled. Don't make a fool of yourself. Show your red and hold her here until you get Big Cloud on the wire. They're both running the same way, aren't they, you blamed idiot? Everything's out of the road far enough east of here. 
on account of the limited to give them time at headquarters to take care of things. Let them have it at Big Cloud. And Big Cloud got it. Spence, the dispatcher on the early night trick, got it, and Carleton and Regan at their homes got it in a hurried call from Spence over their private keys that brought them running to headquarters. I've cleared the line, said Spence. The Limited is holding at Elk River till Brooks Cut reports Owsley through. Then she's to trail along. Carleton nodded and took a chair beside the dispatcher's table. Regan, as ever with him in times of stress, tugged at his mustache and paced up and down the room. He stepped once in front of Carleton and laughed shortly, and there was more in his words, a whole lot more, than he realized then. The Lord knows where he'll stop now with a bit in his mouth. But suppose he'd been heading the other way, into the Limited, hm, head on instead of just tying up all the blame traffic between here and the Elk. What? We can thank God for that. Carleton didn't answer, except by another nod. He was listening to Spence at the key, asking Brooks Cut why they didn't report Owsley through. The rain rattled at the window panes, and the sashes shook under the gusts of wind. Out in the yards below, the switch lights showed blurred and indistinct, Regan paced the room more and more impatiently. Carlton's face began to go hard. Spence hung tensely over the table, his fingers on the key, waiting for the sounder to break, waiting for the brook's cut call. It was only seven miles from Elk River, where the stalled passengers of the Limited, will you remember this, grumbled and complained, pettish in their discontent at the delay, only seven miles from there to brook's cut, the first station east, only seven miles, but the minutes passed and still Brooks Cut answered, No. And Carlton's face grew harder still, and Regan swore deep down under his breath from a full heart, and Spence grew white and rigid in his chair, and so they waited there, waited with the sense of disaster growing cold upon them, waited, but Brooks Cut never reported Owsley in or out that night. Owsley. Who knows what was in the poor, warped brain that night? He had heard her call to him, and they had brought him back to 1601, and she was standing there alone, deserted, and she had called to him. Who knows what was in his mind, as together he and the 1601 went tearing through the black storm-rent night, when the rivers and the creeks and the sluices were running full and the Elk River that paralleled the right-of-way for a mile or two to the crossing was a raging torrent. Who knows if he ever heard the thundering crash with which the Elk River bridge went out? Who knows, as he swung the curve that opened the bridge approach without time for any man, Owsley or another, to have stopped if the headlight played on the surge of maddened waters meant anything to him? Who knows? That was where they found him. Beneath the waters, Owsley and the 1601, and Owsley was smiling, his hand tight-gripped upon the throttle that he loved. "'I don't know,' says Regan when he speaks of Owsley. "'If the mountains out here have anything to do with making a man think harder, I don't know. Sometimes I think they do.' You get to figuring that the Grand Master maybe goes a long way back, years and years to work things out. If it hadn't been for Owsley, the Limited would have gone into the Elk that night with every soul on board. Owsley? <laughs> That's the way he wanted to go out, wasn't it? With the 1601. Maybe the Grand Master thought of him, too. End of Chapter 2 